Chapter 2. Summary of Events. Continued. I made the last of my journey in the cold end of December, in a mighty dry day of frost, and who should be my guide but Peyton MacMorland, brother of Tam? For a tow-headed, bare-legged brat of ten, he had more ill tales upon his tongue than ever I heard the match of, having drunken betimes in his brother's cup. I was still not so old myself. Pride had not yet the upper hand of curiosity, and, indeed, it would have taken any man that cold morning to hear all the old clashes of the country and be shown all the places by the way where strange things had fallen out. I had tales of Claver House as we came through the bogs, and tales of the devil as we came over the top of the scar. As we came in by the abbey, I heard somewhat of the old monks and more of the free traders who use its ruins for a magazine, landing for that cause within a cannon shot of Durrisdeer, and along all the road the Duries and poor Mr. Henry were in the first rank of slander. My mind was thus highly prejudiced against the family I was about to serve, so that I was half surprised when I beheld Durrisdeer itself, lying in a pretty sheltered bay under the Abbey Hill, the house most commodiously built in the French fashion, or perhaps Italianate, for I have no skill in these arts, and the place the most beautified with gardens, lawns, shrubberies, and trees I had ever seen. The money sunk here unproductively would have quite restored the family, but as it was, it cost a revenue to keep it up. Mr. Henry came himself to the door to welcome me, a tall, dark young gentleman, the juries are all black men, of a plain and not cheerful face, very strong in body, but not so strong in health, taking me by the hand without any pride, and putting me at home with plain kind speeches. He led me into the hall, booted as I was, to present me to my lord. It was still daylight, and the first thing I observed was a lozenge of clear glass in the midst of the shield in the painted window, which I remember thinking a blemish on a room otherwise so handsome, with its family portraits, and the parcheted ceiling with pendants, and the carved chimney, in one corner of which my old lord sat reading in his livy. He was like Mr. Henry, with much the same plain countenance, only more subtle and pleasant, and his talk a thousand times more entertaining. He had many questions to ask me, I remember, of Edinburgh College, where I had just received my Mastership of Arts, and of the various professors with whom, and their proficiency, he seemed well acquainted. And thus, talking of things that I knew, I soon got liberty of speech in my new home. In the midst of this came Mrs. Henry into the room. She was very far gone, Miss Catherine being due in about six weeks, which made me think less of her beauty at the first sight, and she used me with more of condescension than the rest, so that, upon all accounts, I kept her in the third place of my esteem. It did not take long before all Peter MacMorland's tales were blotted out of my belief, and I was become, what I have ever since remained, a loving servant of the house of Durrisdeer. Mr. Henry had the chief part of my affection. It was with him I worked, and I found him an exacting master, keeping all his kindness for those hours in which we were unemployed, and in the steward's office not only loading me with work, but viewing me with a shrewd supervision. At length, one day, he looked up from his paper with a kind of timidness, and, says he, Mr. McKellar, I think I ought to tell you that you do very well. That was my first word of commendation, and from that day his jealousy of my performance was relaxed. Soon it was Mr. McKellar here and Mr. McKellar there, with the whole family, and for much of my service at Durrisdeer I have transacted everything in my own time and to my own fancy, and never a farthing challenged. Even while he was driving me I had begun to find my heart go out to Mr. Henry, no doubt partly in pity, he was a man so palpably unhappy. He would fall into a deep muse over our accounts, staring at the page or out of the window, and at those times the look of his face and the sigh that would break from him awoke in me strong feelings of curiosity and commiseration. One day, I remember, 
we were late upon some business in the steward's room this room is at the top of the house and has a view upon the bay and over a little wooded cape on the long sands and there right over against the sun which was then dipping we saw the free traders with a great force of men and horses scouring on the beach mr henry had been staring straight west so that i marvelled he was not blinded by the sun suddenly he frowns rubs his hand upon his brow and turns to me with a smile you would not guess what i was thinking says he i was thinking i would be a happier man if i could ride and run the danger of my life with these lawless companions i told him i had observed he did not enjoy good spirits and that it was a common fancy to envy others and think we should be the better of some change quoting horace to the point like a young man fresh from college why just so said he and with that we may get back to our accounts it was not long before i began to get wind of the causes that so much depressed him indeed a blind man must have soon discovered there was a shadow on that house the shadow of the master of ballantrae dead or alive and he was then supposed to be dead that man was his brother's rival his rival abroad where there was never a good word for mr henry and nothing but regret and praise for the master and his rival at home not only with his father and his wife but with the very servants they were two old serving men that were the leaders john paul a little bald solemn stomachy man a great professor of piety and take him for all in all a pretty faithful servant was the chief of the master's faction none durst go so far as john he took a pleasure in disregarding mr henry publicly often with a slighting comparison my lord and mrs henry took him up to be sure but never so resolutely as they should and he had only to pull his weeping face and begin his lamentations for the master his laddie as he called him to have the whole condoned as for henry he let these things pass in silence sometimes with a sad and sometimes with a black look there was no rivalling the dead he knew that and how to censure an old serving man for a fault of loyalty was more than he could see his was not the tongue to do it mcconachie was the chief upon the other side an old ill-spoken swearing ranting drunken dog and i have often thought it an odd circumstance in human nature that these two serving men should each have been the champion of his contrary and blackened their own faults and made light of their own virtues when they beheld them in a master mcconachie had soon smelled out my secret inclination took me much into his confidence and would rant against the master by the hour so that even my work suffered they're all daft here he would cry and be damned to them the master that deals in their thrapples that should call him say it's mr henry should be master now they were nane so fond of the master when they had him i'll can tell ye that sorrow on his name never a good word did i hear on his lips for naebody else but just fleering and flighting and profane cursing deal him there's nane kent his wickedness him a gentleman did ever ye hear tell mr mackellar a woolly white the webster no ah weel woolly was an unco praying kind of man a dray body nane o my kind and never could abide the sight of him anyway he was a great hand by his way o it and he up and rebuked the master for some of his ongoings was a grand thing for the master of bantry to tack up a feud where webster was not mcconachie would sneer indeed he never took the full name upon his lips but with a sort of a whine of hatred but he did a fine employ it was chapping at the man's door and crying boo in his lum and putting poother in his fire and peoys in his window note peoys a kind of firework made with damp powder returned to text so the men thought it was old horney was come seeking them 
We'll, to make a long story short, Woolly gaed geit. At the hinder end they could not get him frae his knees, but he just roared and prayed and grats chalked on till he got his release. It was fair murder. Oh, but he said that. Ask John Paul. He was brawly ashamed of that game. Him, but sick a Christian man. Grand doings for the master of boundary. I asked him what the master had thought of it himself. How would I ken, says he. He never said naething. And on again in his usual manner of banning and swearing, with every now and again a master of boundary sneered through his nose. It was in one of these confidences that he showed me the Carlyle letter, the print of the horseshoe still stamped in the paper. Indeed, that was our last confidence, for he then expressed himself so ill-naturedly of Mrs. Henry that I had to reprimand him sharply and must thenceforth hold him at a distance. My old lord was uniformly kind to Mr. Henry. He had even pretty ways of gratitude, and would sometimes clap him on the shoulder and say, as if to the world at large, This is a very good son to me and grateful he was, no doubt, being a man of sense and justice. But I think that was all, and I'm sure Mr. Henry thought so. The love was all for the dead son. Not that this was often given breath to. Indeed, with me, but once. My lord had asked me one day how I got on with Mr. Henry, and I had told him the truth. Ay, said he, looking sideways on the burning fire, Henry is a good lad. A very good lad, said he. You have heard, Mr. McKellar, that I had another son? I am afraid he was not so virtuous a lad as Mr. Henry. Oh, dear me, he's dead, Mr. McKellar. And while he lived, we were all very proud of him. All very proud. If he was not all he should have been in some ways, well, perhaps we loved him better. This last, he said, looking musingly in the fire, and then to me, with a great deal of briskness, But I am rejoiced you do so well with Mr. Henry. You will find him a good master. And with that he opened his book, which was the customary signal of dismission. But it would be little that he read, and less that he understood. Culloden Field and the master, these would be the burthen of his thought. And the burthen of mine was an unnatural jealousy of the dead man, for Mr. Henry's sake, that had even then begun to grow on me. I am keeping Mrs. Henry for the last, so that this expression of my sentiment may seem unwarrantably strong. The reader shall judge for himself when I have done. But I must first tell of another matter which was the means of bringing me more intimate. I had not yet been six months at Dearest Dear when it chanced that John Paul fell sick and must keep his bed. Drink was the root of his malady in my poor thought, but he was tended and indeed carried himself like an afflicted saint, and the very minister who came to visit him professed himself edified when he went away. The third morning of his sickness Mr. Henry comes to me with something of a hangdog look. McKellar, says he, I wish I could trouble you upon a little service. There is a pension we pay. It is John's part to carry it, and now that he is sick, I know not to whom I should look, unless it was yourself. The matter is very delicate. I could not carry it with my own hand for a sufficient reason. I dare not send McConachy, who is a talker, and I am, I have... I am desirous this should not come to Mrs. Henry's ears, says he, and flushed to his neck as he said it. To say truth, when I found I was to carry money to one Jessie Brown, who was no better than she should be, I supposed it was some trip of his own that Mr. Henry was dissembling. I was the more impressed when the truth came out. It was up a wind off a side street in St. Bride's that Jessie had her lodging, the place was very ill-inhabited, mostly by the free-trading sort. There was a man with a broken head at the entry. Halfway up, in a tavern, fellows were roaring and singing, though it was not yet nine in the day. 
Altogether I had never seen a worse neighbourhood, even in the great city of Edinburgh, and I was in two minds to go back. Jessie's room was of a piece with her surroundings, and herself no better. She would not give me the receipt, which Mr. Henry had told me to demand, for he was very methodical, until she had sent out for spirits, and I had pledged her in a glass, and all the time she carried on in a light-headed, reckless way, now aping the manners of a lady, now breaking into unseemly mirth, now making coquettish advances that oppressed me to the ground. Of the money she spoke more tragically. "'It's blood money,' said she. "'I take it for that. "'Blood money for the betrayed. "'See what I'm brought down to. "'Ah, if the bonny lad were back again, "'it would be changed to days. "'But he's deed. "'He's lying deed among the Heeland hills, "'the bonny lad, the bonny lad.' "'She had a rapt manner of crying on the bonny lad, "'clasping her hands and casting up her eyes,' that I think she must have learned of strolling players, and I thought her sorrow very much of an affectation, and that she dwelled upon the business because her shame was now all she had to be proud of. I will not say I did not pity her, but it was a loathing pity at the best, and her last change of manner wiped it out. This was when she had had enough of me for an audience, and had set her name at last to the receipt. There, says she, and taking the most unwomanly oaths upon her tongue, bade me be gone and carry it to the Judas who had sent me. It was the first time I had heard the name applied to Mr. Henry. I was staggered, besides, at her sudden vehemence of word and manner, and got forth from the room under this shower of curses like a beaten dog. But even then I was not quit, for the vixen threw up her window, and leaning forth, continued to revile me as I went up the wind. The free traders, coming to the tavern door, joined in the mockery, and one had even the inhumanity to set upon me a very savage small dog which bit me in the ankle. This was a strong lesson, had I required one, to avoid ill company, and I rode home in much pain from the bite and considerable indignation of mind. Mr. Henry was in the steward's room affecting employment, but I could see he was only impatient to hear of my errand. Well, says he, as soon as I came in, and when I had told him something of what passed, and that Jessie seemed an undeserving woman, and far from grateful, she is no friend to me, said he, but indeed, Mackellar, I have few friends to boast of, and Jessie has some cause to be unjust. I need not dissemble what all the country knows. She was not very well used by one of our family. This was the first time I had heard him refer to the master, even distantly, and I think he found his tongue rebellious even for that much. But presently he resumed. This is why I would have nothing said. It would give pain to Mrs. Henry, and to my father, he added, with another flush. Mr. Henry, said I, if you will take a freedom at my hands, I would tell you to let that woman be. What service is your money to the like of her? She has no sobriety and no economy. As for gratitude, you will as soon get milk from a Winston. And if you will pretermit your bounty, it will make no change at all, but just to save the ankles of your messengers. Mr. Henry smiled. "'But I am grieved about your ankle,' said he, the next moment, with a proper gravity. "'And observe,' I continued, "'I give you this advice upon consideration. "'And yet my heart was touched for the woman in the beginning.' "'Why, there it is, you see,' said Mr. Henry. "'And you are to remember that I knew her once a very decent lass. "'Besides which, although I speak little of my family, "'I think much of its repute.' "'And with that he broke up the talk.' which was the first we had had together in such confidence. For the same afternoon I had the proof that his father was perfectly acquainted with the business, and that it was only from his wife that Mr. Henry kept it secret. "'I fear you had a painful errand today,' says my lord to me, "'for which, as it enters in no way among your duties, I wish to thank you, and to remind you at the same time 
in case Mr. Henry should have neglected, how very desirable it is that no word of it should reach my daughter. Reflections on the dead, Mr. McKellar, are doubly painful. Anger glowed in my heart, and I could have told my lord to his face how little he had to do, bolstering up the image of the dead in Mrs. Henry's heart, and how much better he were employed to shatter that false idol for by this time I saw very well how the land lay between my patron and his wife. My pen is clear enough to tell a plain tale, but to render the effect of an infinity of small things not one great enough in itself to be narrated, and to translate the story of looks and the message of voices when they are saying no great matter, and to put in half a page the essence of near eighteen months, this is what I despair to accomplish. The fault, to be very blunt, lay all in Mrs. Henry. She felt it a merit to have consented to the marriage, and she took it like a martyrdom, in which my old lord, whether he knew it or not, fomented her. She made a merit, besides, of her constancy to the dead, though its name to a nicer conscience should have seemed rather disloyalty to the living. And here also my lord gave her his countenance. I suppose he was glad to talk of his loss, and ashamed to dwell on it with Mr. Henry. Certainly, at least, he made a little coterie apart in that family of three, and it was the husband who was shut out. It seems it was an old custom, when the family were alone in Durastir, that my lord should take his wine to the chimney-side, and Miss Allison, instead of withdrawing, should bring a stool to his knee, and chatter to him privately." and after she had become my patron's wife, the same manner of doing was continued. It should have been pleasant to behold this ancient gentleman so loving with his daughter, but I was too much a partisan of Mr. Henry's to be anything but wroth at his exclusion. Many's the time I have seen him make an obvious resolve, quit the table, and go and join himself to his wife and my lord Duris dear, and on their part they were never backward to make him welcome, turned to him smilingly as to an intruding child, and took him into their talk with an effort so ill-concealed that he was soon back again beside me at the table, whence, so great is the hall of Durisdeer, we could but hear the murmur of voices at the chimney. There he would sit and watch, and I along with him, and sometimes, by my lord's head sorrowfully shaken, or his hand laid on Mrs. Henry's head, or hers upon his knee, as if in consolation, or sometimes by an exchange of tearful looks, we would draw our conclusion that the talk had gone to the old subject and the shadow of the dead was in the hall. I have hours when I blame Mr. Henry for taking all too patiently. Yet we are to remember he was married in pity and accepted his wife upon that term, and indeed he had small encouragement to make a stand. Once, I remember, he announced he had found a man to replace the pane of the stained window, which, as it was he that managed all the business, was the thing clearly within his attributions. But to the master's fanciers that pain was like a relic, and on the first word of any change the blood flew to Mrs. Henry's face. "'I wonder at you,' she cried. "'I wonder at myself,' says Mr. Henry, with more of bitterness than I had ever heard him to express." Thereupon my old lord stepped in with his smooth talk, so that before the meal was at an end all seemed forgotten, only that after dinner, when the pair had withdrawn as usual to the chimney-side, we could see her weeping with her head upon his knee. Mr. Henry kept up the talk with me upon some topic of the estates, he could speak of little else but business, and was never the best of company, but he kept it up that day with more continuity his eye straying ever and again to the chimney, and his voice changing to another key, but without check of delivery. The pain, however, was not replaced, and I believe he counted it a great defeat. Whether he was stout enough or no, God knows he was kind enough. Mrs. Henry had a manner of condescension with him, such as, in a wife, would have pricked my vanity into an ulcer. He took it like a favour. She held him at the staff's end, forgot, and then remembered, and unbent to him, as we do to children, burthened him with cold kindness, reproved him with a change of colour and a bitten lip, like one shamed by his disgrace, 
ordered him with a look of the eye when she was off her guard, when she was on the watch, pleaded with him for the most natural attentions, as though they were unheard of favours, and to all this he replied with the most unwearied service, loving, as folk say, the very ground she trod on, and carrying that love in his eyes as bright as a lamp. When Miss Catherine was to be born, nothing would serve but he must stay in the room behind the head of the bed. There he sat, as white, they tell me, as a sheet, and the sweat dropping from his brow, and the handkerchief he had in his hand was crushed into a little ball no bigger than a musket bullet. Nor could he bear the sight of Miss Catherine for many a day. Indeed, I doubt if he was ever what he should have been to my young lady, for the which want of natural feeling he was loudly blamed. Such was the state of this family down to the 7th April, 1749, when there befell the first of that series of events which were to break so many hearts and lose so many lives. On that day I was sitting in my room a little before supper, when John Paul burst open the door with no civility of knocking, and told me there was one below that wished to speak with the steward, sneering at the name of my office. I asked what manner of man and what his name was, and this disclosed the cause of John's ill-humour, for it appeared the visitor refused to name himself except to me, a sore affront to the major-domo's consequence. Well, said I, smiling a little, I will see what he wants. I found in the entrance hall a big man, very plainly habited and wrapped in a sea-cloak, like one new landed, as indeed he was. Not far off, McConachy was standing, with his tongue out of his mouth, and his hand upon his chin, like a dull fellow thinking hard, and the stranger, who had brought his cloak about his face, appeared uneasy. He had no sooner seen me coming than he went to meet me with an effusive manner. "'My dear man,' said he, "'a thousand apologies for disturbing you, but I'm in the most awkward position. And there's a son of a ramrod there that I should know the looks of, and more betoken, I believe, that he knows mine. Being in this family, sir, and in a place of some responsibility, which was the cause I took the liberty to send for you, you are doubtless of the honest party? You may be sure, at least, says I, that all of that party are quite safe in dearest dear. My dear man, it is my very thought, says he. You see, I have just been set on shore here by a very honest man whose name I cannot remember, and who is to stand off and on for me till morning, at some danger to himself, and, to be clear with you, I am a little concerned lest it should be at some to me. I have saved my life so often, Mr. I forget your name, which is a very good one, that faith I would be very loath to lose it after all, and the son of a ramrod whom I believe I saw before Carlyle. Oh, sir, said I, you can trust McConaughey until tomorrow. Well, and it's a delight to hear you say so, says the stranger. The truth is that my name is not a very suitable one in this country of Scotland. With a gentleman like you, my dear man, I would have no concealments, of course. And by your leave, I'll just breathe it in your ear. They call me Francis Burke, Colonel Francis Burke and I am here at a most damnable risk to myself to see your masters, if you'll excuse me, my good man, for giving them the name, for I'm sure it's a circumstance I would never have guessed from your appearance. And if you would just be so very obliging as to take my name to them, you might say that I come bearing letters, which I am sure they will be very rejoiced to have the reading of. Colonel Francis Burke was one of the Prince's Irishmen, they did his cause such an infinity of hurt, and were so much distasted of the Scots at the time of the rebellion, and it came at once into my mind how the master of Ballantry had astonished all men by going with that party. In the same moment a strong foreboding of the truth possessed my soul. If you will step in here, said I, opening a chamber door, I will let my lord know. And I am sure it's very good of you, Mr. What's-your-name says the colonel. Up to the hall I went, slow-footed. There they were, all three, my old lord in his place, Mrs. Henry at work by the window, Mr. Henry, as was much his custom, pacing the low end. 
In the midst was the table laid for supper. I told them briefly what I had to say. My old lord lay back in his seat. Mrs. Henry sprang up, standing with a mechanical motion, and she and her husband stared at each other's eyes across the room. It was the strangest, challenging look these two exchanged, and as they looked the colour faded in their faces. Then Mr. Henry turned to me, not to speak, only to sign with his finger. But that was enough, and I went down again for the colonel. When we returned, these three were in much the same position I had left them in. I believe no word had passed. My lord dearest dear, no doubt, says the colonel, bowing, and my lord bowed in answer. And this, continues the colonel, should be the master of ballantry? I have never taken that name, said Mr. Henry, but I am Henry Dury at your service. Then the colonel turns to Mrs. Henry, bowing with his hat upon his heart, and the most killing airs of gallantry. There can be no mistake about so fine a figure of a lady, says he. I address the seductive Miss Allison, of whom I have so often heard. Once more the husband and wife exchanged a look. I am Mrs. Henry Dury, said she, but before my marriage my name was Allison Graham. Then my lord spoke up. I am an old man, Colonel Burke, said he, and a frail one. It will be mercy on your part to be expeditious. Do you bring me news of... He hesitated, and then the words broke from him with a singular change of voice. My son? My dear lord, I will be round with you like a soldier, said the colonel. I do. My lord held out a wavering hand. He seemed to wave a signal, but whether it was to give him time or to speak on was more than we could guess. At length he got out the one word, Good? Why, the very best in the creation, cries the colonel, for my good friend and admired comrade is at this hour in the fine city of Paris, and as like as not, if I know anything of his habits, he will be drawing in his chair to a piece of dinner. But, Dad, I believe the lady's fainting. Mrs. Henry was indeed the colour of death, and drooped against the window frame. But when Mr. Henry made a movement as if to run to her, she straightened with a sort of shiver. I am well, she said, with her white lips. Mr. Henry stopped, and his face had a strong twitch of anger. The next moment he had turned to the colonel. You must not blame yourself, says he, for this effect on Mrs. Jury. It is only natural. We were all brought up like brother and sister. Mrs. Henry looked at her husband with something like relief, or even gratitude. In my way of thinking, that speech was the first step he made in her good graces. You must try to forgive me, Mrs. Jury, for indeed I am just an Irish savage, said the colonel, and I deserve to be shot for not breaking the matter more artistically to a lady. But here are the master's own letters, one for each of the three of you, and to be sure, if I know anything of my friend's genius, he will tell his own story with a better grace. He brought the three letters forth as he spoke, arranged them by the superscriptions, presented the first to my lord, who took it greedily, and advanced towards Mrs. Henry, holding out the second. But the lady waved it back. To my husband, says she, with a choked voice. The colonel was a quick man, but at this he was somewhat nonplussed. To be sure, says he, how very dull of me, to be sure, but he still held the letter. At last Mr. Henry reached forth his hand, and there was nothing to be done but give it up. Mr. Henry took the letters, both hers and his own, and looked upon their outside with his brows knit hard, as if he were thinking. He had surprised me all through by his excellent behaviour, but he was to excel himself now. "'Let me give you a hand to your room,' said he to his wife. "'This has come something of the suddenest, and at any rate you will wish to read your letter by yourself. Again she looked upon him with the same thought of wonder, but he gave her no time, coming straight to where she stood. It will be better so, believe me, said he, and Colonel Burke is too considerate not to excuse you. And with that he took her hand by the fingers and led her from the hall. Mrs. Henry returned no more that night, and when Mr. Henry went to visit her next morning, as I heard long afterwards, she gave him the letter again, still unopened. 
Oh, read it and be done, he had cried. Spare me that, said she. And by these two speeches, to my way of thinking, each undid a great part of what they had previously done well. But the letter, sure enough, came into my hands, and by me was burned, unopened. You'll be very exact as to the adventures of the master after Culloden. I wrote not long ago to Colonel Burke, now a chevalier of the Order of saint Louis, begging him for some notes in writing, since I could scarce depend upon my memory at so great an interval. To confess the truth, I have been somewhat embarrassed by his response, for he sent me the complete memoirs of his life, touching only in places on the master, running to a much greater length than my whole story, and not everywhere, as it seems to me, designed for edification. He begged in his letter, dated from Ettenheim, that I would find a publisher for the whole, after I had made what use of it I required, and I think I shall best answer my own purpose and fulfil his wishes by giving certain parts of it in full. In this way my readers will have a detailed, and I believe a very genuine account of some essential matters. And if any publisher should take a fancy to the Chevalier's manner of narration, he knows where to apply for the rest, of which there is plenty at his service. I put in my first extract here, so that it may stand in the place of what the Chevalier told us over our wine in the hall of Durestir. But you are to suppose it was not the brutal fact, but a a very varnished version that he offered to my lord. End of chapter 2 Recording by Thomas Copeland